In this video, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of your Rohan Royal Guard models and how to make a sweet Dale Wine conversion. My name's Lachlan Linton Keane and welcome to the third installment of The Muster of Rohan, the series where we follow my Rohan army through the 2019 league season. BrizCon is just one week away, which is going to be the first major event for my Rohan army and it is in pretty bad shape. I have got a lot of models that aren't even assembled, a lot of painting to do, so you can certainly expect quite a few episodes of The Muster of Rohan to be coming out over the next couple of days. Now, uh, BrizCon is a really fantastic event here in the Brisbane gaming season. It's an 800 point escalating event, so we start small and grow over the course of the four matches. And we're gonna do a video later in the week going through all of my lists and how I'm gonna approach the tournament. And at the tournament itself, we're also gonna be filming everything and releasing full battle reports of every single one of my games. We're gonna have some incredible event coverage, much like the coverage we did at Arda Unleashed for the championship round. So it's gonna be pretty awesome. You guys are gonna be able to follow the whole progress of my army through the tournament, but before we even get to the tournament, we need to have a finished army. So, we're going to be focusing on getting some of it up to scratch today. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with my list, I'm playing Thaden's Legendary Legion, focusing heavily on heroes, and then filling out the rest with a big chunk of Rohan Royal Guard. And that is what we're going to be having a look at today. Now, for anyone who knows the Rohan Royal Guard models, they are absolutely beautiful, but of course, they come in metal blisters, and there is very little variation among them. You can pretty much only get two blisters available on the store now and uh, I was lucky enough to still have some of the really old poses from the Battle Games in Middle Earth magazine so essentially I'm working from about three poses and I've got 12 Royal Guard uh, in my biggest list. So what I'm going to do today is uh, teach you guys a whole bunch of tips and tricks that you can use to make those three individual poses turn into a whole bunch of variety on the battlefield. Lots of really dynamic posing, lots of kind of interest and intrigue that you can build into your form so it looks absolutely fantastic on the table and you don't have a whole bunch of repeated poses in a big mirror image which is not nice when you're looking at a really lovely combined force. Now the other thing that we're going to do today is have a look at the captain of the Royal Guard, Dale Wine. Now of course Dale Wine doesn't have an official model yet. We might be getting one, we're still not sure. We did just get our Dernhelm model which is exciting so he could be on the horizon but for the meantime we need to do something pretty cool uh, to kind of set him out on the table and make him look Look like he belongs in the Royal Guard, uh, but make him look pretty special as well so he stands out. So I've got a pretty simple but effective conversion that you guys can easily do at home uh, to give yourself a really nice day of wine in the meantime. But first we're going to tackle our Royal Guard, so let's jump into our first couple of models and have a look at how we can bring some really dynamic posing to these classic metal sculpts. So here are the three Rohan Royal Guard variants that we have access to. This one is the oldest from the Battle Games in Middle-Earth magazine series. He used to be uh, able to be turned into a banner bearer and there are a whole lot of these on the second hand market so I've got quite a few of these to play with. And then there are the two more classic positions uh, that come in the Rohan Royal Guard blister from Games Workshop. This guy is just holding his spear down by his side and looking to the left and then this gentleman is looking to the right and hurling his spear at some unseen foe. So some pretty great poses, but if we had those three over and over again, would still be pretty kind of flat and boring. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with the oldest first, uh, this uh, Rohan Royal Guard, uh, with a particularly long spear, you'll notice. It's quite big and, uh, and, and really, really long and tall compared to the other kind of shorter spears, and I'm going to really lean into that. And something that I'm a big fan of is posing uh, Rohan units so that their spear 
spears are less throwing spear and more in a kind of lance position. This whole kind of, uh, I guess, theme that's developed of Rohan having throwing spears and not using their spears like lances in combat to break upon their enemy's shields and create thrusting blows is completely historically inaccurate. Yes, they did throw their spears around, that certainly happened, and the whole reason we have throwing spears in SBG is probably because Aima kills that Mahad controlling the uh, controlling the Mumakil, uh, but Rohan more, more usually would use their spears as lances in combat. If I had my way, we'd have some kind of cool throwing spear lance hybrid, but of course, you know, uh, I love Rohan and it's probably not particularly balanced. So, what we're going to do is we're going to come in here, we're going to grab our scalpel or a, a bit of a razor saw, uh, and we're going to come in and separate this spear uh, here, and then that will free up the whole arm to be able to do a bit of rotational work and uh, change the elevation and angle of the spear so that we can get some, uh, some more kind of thrusting, lancing kind of positions, uh, which should create a really dynamic force. So for separating the spear, we've got a couple of tools at our disposal. Obviously, our main scalpel, although getting through metal can be a bit of hard work with a tool like this. We've got our clippers with the pincing action, which can really get in there and, and break it apart. Could be a good option. And then we've also got something more serious like this, which is a razor saw. And I've got two different blades here with uh, two different teeth sizes, so we could get a bit of sawing action to separate that, although there is a little bit of chance that we could obscure some of the surrounding detail. So I'm not going to go for razor saw straight up. I think what I'm actually going to do is see if I can just get a lucky little snip with these clippers uh, if I can just get them in here underneath because um, we're not too concerned about damaging the pole that's pretty easy stuff to green stuff what we don't want to damage right is this uh, this beautiful detail here on the uh, the, the leg roll uh, just under the knee pad so let's see if we can get our clippers in here now it would have been better if he wasn't on his base for this but that's all right I don't want to damage the leg that's there either. All right, I've got a pretty good purchase. There we go, yeah, that's coming up. So I'm just applying enough pressure to get in and under, but you can see all of my application and all of my force is going on to the pole itself, which is perfect, because I don't want it on the armor plating. Yes, look at that, perfect. So you can see we lost a little bit of the pole, not really a big deal. Uh, but now that is free and we'll be able to clean that up and come in and clean everything else up. So let's see what we can do with this guy. Now this should be a pretty flexible arm joint. But what we have to do is we have to try and make sure when we're bending this arm that the model is bending at the elbow joint. Otherwise his pose won't look particularly natural. We have to make sure as we bend it that we don't warp any of this detail here on the armor plating. So you've got to be really careful with your fingers. So our, our two turning points are the wrist and the elbow. All right, well, his arm has popped off perfectly at the joint, which is gonna be even better for us because we'll be able to reattach it. So now what I'm gonna do is focus on this elbow joint. All right, so to help make that elbow joint nice and cooperative, I'm just gonna make a gentle incision on the inner joint, and that way we should be able to get a bit more of a bend out of it. So you just wanna grab your razor saw, gently rest it on the spot, and, and pick an angle where you're not gonna obscure any other detail, and just nice and gently let the blade of the saw do the work. There we go, so we've taken about two mil out. I might go a little bit deeper. Now just bear in mind, I'm cutting cloth here. Cloth is the easiest thing to fix with green stuff. So I don't really care how much cloth I have to take away. I'd really love to not have to cut this off entirely, reposition and pin it. So I'm already gonna have to do that with the wrist. If I can get away, just keeping this, the still attached but repositioned. That would be awesome. All right, there we go. I've got a good, good cut now. Okay, so I, I mean, I could just cut that off and the spear would still be of perfectly fine length, but his hand will be pretty far up. So I'm gonna see how much of this I can save. Beautiful. Be able to tidy that up with green stuff. Fantastic. Okay, so next up we want to uh, pin our hand back. So I'm just going to grab my pin vise and I'll just grab a different drill bit. 
So I've just picked a pretty small size drill bit here and I'm just going to take my pin vise, line it up and make a small hole in both the hand and the wrist and then we can put a little bit of a pin in them. Right, so I've made my first incision, yep that's nice and lined up. Now I'll go ahead and do the full bore. Can be quite tricky pinning hands because obviously they're very small so if your drill bit wanders you can certainly pay the price because there's a lot of detail there that you can destroy. We all know how awful it is sculpting fingers. So I just like to regularly check. <sighs> yeah, so it looks like that hole is in a nice spot. I'll continue. So the key with pinning is to just take your time with your drilling. Apply even pressure, but not too firmly, and just let the drill bit do all the work for you. All right, so obviously that is tiny. You guys probably can't see that really well, but that's about four millimeters deep, which should be perfect. And then I'm just gonna come to the center of the hand here, of the wrist, I should say. Line up my drill bit. Mark my initial incision. Yep, that looks pretty good. Now make sure when you're lining your drill bit up here that you don't go completely flat with the surface because that's the angle that it's broken on. We want to go in line with the line of the wrist so we don't actually, you know, drill all the way out of the wrist pad. That would be bad. Now I'll go a bit deeper here. I can afford to go quite deep into the wrist. Yep, that's looking good, that's about four mil, but we're gonna probably go double that. Now what we'll do is we'll come in with our little bit of rod, join those together with just a small rod piece, and then we can green stuff the joins and fix that, and we'll be good to go. Okay, so now I've grabbed myself a tiny little piece of steel rod. Uh, I've actually been an out of modeling rod, so I've just used a, uh, a safety pin and cut it up with my side cutters. And you'll notice, I'll just make sure you guys can see that, that it's got a slight little ridge in it. Uh, it's, it's not completely straight, it goes down at one end, and that's so that I can help accentuate the curve of the wrist. So now what I'm gonna do is take the long end and insert that into my wrist. That's gonna come straight in that tiny little hole there. Come on, be nice to me. And then we will take the bent end and that will come into that little end there and it should look pretty awesome. So what we're gonna do is uh, change up. We're gonna use some uh, CA glue, cyanoacrylate. Uh, my favorite brand is Zappagap. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's got about a 20 second working time, so it's relatively generous. What I'm gonna do is just apply some glue into the wrist joint to start with. Uh, it's certainly gonna be the easiest one. Now, uh, where did my little piece of rod go? I bet you guys can see it and I'm just going blind. Uh, so I've just applied a little dab of glue to the wrist, that's where we're gonna start. And now I'll slide the long end in without the bend. And what I'll do is I'll just grab my spear shaft and even though there's no glue in it, I'm just gonna use this to line up where I want the bend to go. So yeah, that should work pretty perfectly there. So now I'll just take my wrist off gently and we'll let that one dry. Uh, the hole is slightly larger than the steel rod, but that'll be fine once it's all glued up. So we're just gonna let that cook off in about 20 seconds and then we'll come in and uh, glue on our thrusting lance. Now that's dried, I'll just chuck a little bit more glue on the end of the steel rod. Letting it run right down into the join. And now we'll come in with our thrusting spear and we can set a pose and hold it. So now it's just a matter of sitting here for 20 seconds and letting it cook off. So now that our arm has been repositioned into a suitably dynamic pose, our next step is to jump in and just fill this tiny little gap here uh, between the wrist and the hand. And that way we can uh, get a nice smooth join that will look perfect once it's all painted up. Uh, the benefit of course of the Royal Guard is that they are wearing a sort of full cloth outfit so we don't really have too much trouble to kind of make that detail look nice and seamless because it can just be a little bit more of his red undergarment. So as always we're just going to use a little bit of green stuff uh, so we just grab an equal portions of green and blue 
equal portions of the two colours and smash them together until we get a nice green consistency. Uh, I just like to sculpt with my scalpel blade, uh, it's nice and simple, if I'm doing more complex stuff I'll bust out some proper tools, but for little filling like this it's not a big deal at all. Grab a little bit of green stuff on the top of our blade and go and deposit it into our crack and then clean the blade, dip it in a bit of water and that way the blade won't contact and stick to the green stuff and it allows us to shape it. So we want to get it right in there into that little crack but what we need to be careful of is uh, obscuring any of the detail on uh, this forearm. That beautiful gold detail on the arm guard uh, is something that we definitely don't want to uh, don't want to lose. Uh, now that's probably a little bit too thick. What we want to do is have the uh, the cloth underneath be thinner than that arm guard, so that we can really see the arm guard protruding up over. So that's the wrist done, we have a nice perfectly seamless arm, the only other little section is just to re-sculpt the back of our spear here, so we'll just grab a little bit more of my green stuff, uh, and this one is even easier, we can just grab a big clump on, stick it onto that hole, uh, you can kind of begin to make the, uh, the shape with your fingers, and then come in with water on your blade, and just smooth it all out. And there we go, a perfectly gap-filled spear and a wonderful little wrist join. And now our royal guard is ready to go in a nice different pose to all of his brethren. So we've now created a couple of variants of our kind of classic battle games in Middle-earth royal guard with these two kind of lancing positions with the big long spears which is going to create some nice variation but there's also a couple of the more standard royal guard variants here we can see one of mine with the throwing spear position raised up above the head and then the uh, other standard kind of holding spear position so I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, quick variants that I've made for these positions as well with some more royal guard that I have on the firing line. So, uh, we've got our, our throwing guy here, as you can see, that's just in the classic position, and then just using the exact same techniques, I've come in for this model, and I've uh, really hacked away at this elbow joint in here with my razor saw to get a slight change in angle, I'll show you a side by side there, of, uh, of the two guys, uh, which isn't particularly apparent when you're just looking at them uh, in this format, but what it does result is in a completely different spear angle, which is much more more kind of thrust downwards uh, which is gonna look pretty fantastic when he is spearing an enemy model uh, as you can see uh, when he's on his horse I've left a lot of negative space on that base and he's going to be able to be spearing an enemy orc uh, which will probably be uh, someone like this fellow uh, modeled onto his base which will be quite a cool dynamic piece uh, and then of course uh, I've also had to have a couple of variants with a sword because of my particular army list so I gave one of those as well just to add a bit more flavor to the uh, raised arm models and then for our uh, normal fellow here who's just holding his spear by his side I've once again come in uh, with the razor saw and uh, and really hacked apart uh, at that kind of inner elbow join and done a pretty serious twist and reposition of that wrist to get someone who is kind of lancing over to the right rather than holding it uh, on the side which once uh, we get him on a little horse let's grab someone like this uh, you can see that that completely changes uh, the spear angle to be onto the other side of the horse where he's actually looking, uh, which I quite like because uh, in, in this more classic pose, he's sort of looking off to the right while just holding his spear on the other side. Sorry, looking to the left. Uh, so that's just a, a couple of bit, bits of extra flavor that you can add in uh, to kind of really remodel all of your various royal guard because variation is very important and when there's really only basically three poses to choose from, you have to start getting a little bit creative. So the Royal Guard contingent of my Legendary Legion is starting to look absolutely fantastic. We've got lots of really dynamic varied poses. I've actually sorted it so that uh, I do not have a single repetition across all 12 of the Royal Guard in my army, which is pretty cool. And I think these, gonna, these guys are going to look pretty impressive on the battlefield. But there are still two major elements that we have to consider. Uh, the first of which is uh, my Royal Guard Bannerman. Uh, my banner kind of jumps in the list from the 
450 point version onwards and he's pretty key. Uh, so what I've got here is just one of the Rohan Royal Guard, uh, sorry, the Rohan Riders, uh, the Banner Bearer model there from the Metal Blister. There is a foot and a mounted version and we're going to do a bit of uh, Royal Guard magic to turn him into a Royal Guard. He's of course going to need a shield as well as some throwing spears. So we'll do something pretty cool there as well. And then the kind of big Royal Guard element that we're missing is of course Daewine, the captain of the Royal Guard. So we're going to put together a pretty sweet little conversion for him. So we're going to start with a Son of Earl model, one of my old Son of Earls from my battle companies. He used to be Folkwine, now he will be Daewine. Uh, and uh, and he, uh, well yeah, they're not really getting much love in competition these days. You've got to take Earl the Young to make them effective. So uh, it seems like a good kind of really awesome model uh, that's going to give Daewine a lot of presence on the battlefield. And then he's going to need a little bit of Royal Guard spice as well. We're going to give him uh, a bit of a sword arm with some Royal Guard shoulder pads as well as a Royal Guard shield. And that is where we're going to start first because of course these Royal Guard shields are one of the most recognizable elements of their whole armor. Uh, this beautiful circular kind of feature with all the gold detailing, they look absolutely awesome and the only way to get them is on these models and I don't have any spare lying around that I want to go butchering so what we're going to do is create some temporary molds and make some new shields out of green stuff. So today we're going to be working with blue stuff. Now we've all heard of green stuff, but blue stuff is a wonderful product that I get from Green Stuff World. Uh, it's essentially a thermoplastic which creates a reusable mold. You drop this into some hot water uh, for about three minutes, and once it goes all soft and pliable, you jam it onto a model, and it gives you a negative impression. And then you can pack that full of green stuff or resin or whatever you want to use to get a mold. Here is one that I've already made uh, of a Royal Guard shield, and here is another one that I. Have already packed full of uh, green stuff and once this is hardened we'll be able to peel that out and get ourselves the beginnings of a beautiful shield. They need a little bit of work to uh, to kind of really sing on the battlefield. But of course, the great thing with shields is you're really only worrying about one side with a lot of these Royal Guard poses because they're, you know, pressed up against the model and whatnot. So we're going to jump into setting up uh, one of these molds and I'll take you guys through the whole process so you guys can make some uh, shields for your Royal Guard at home. And then once we've done that, we'll move on to finishing off Daewine and my Banner Bearer and then the Royal Guard contingent of my army for now will be finished. So the first thing that we want is a big cup of boiling water. Now make sure you fill the cup all the way up to the top so that you've got a good volume of water so that you don't get any uh, kind of heat drop off as the whole volume cools too quickly and that way it can stay nice and hot. And then we simply grab our thermoplastic and drop it in the cup and we're going to leave it there for about three minutes until it goes soft and squishy. Uh, when you uh, kind of pull it out you'll feel a really nice amount of give and it will be quite sort of tacky and uh, then it's ready to mold. So let's wait three minutes and we'll come right back. So three minutes has passed and our lovely little blue stuff has gone nice and soft. Watch out, that is hot water. You can see, look at that, it is very, very soft indeed. So what we're going to do now is just grab our Royal Guard model and uh, grab our blue stuff and just smush it right on there. I'm just going to grab this out without touching the water and push it together, get a nice firm bond and then just jam it right on there and hold it nice and tightly. Now it's important to keep uh, a bit of pressure from all directions on whatever you're molding. Uh, this is obviously a way too large a bit of blue stuff to make just this little shield mold but just to show you guys how it works. Uh, and that way um, with keeping the pressure on from all directions it doesn't allow the mold to deform in weird ways as it cools which can happen a little bit. Uh, often as you apply too much pressure you'll get a bit of kind of over molding I guess it sort of wraps around and gets in and all around it but that's not a problem once you fill it with green stuff and that goes hard it'll pop out all around so we'll wait for this to cool down I'll get it out of the steam because that's keeping it hot and then we'll have a look at how the mold turns out all right, so she's cooled down a little bit. Now, of course, because this piece of blue stuff is so big, we've taken a fair amount of mold, but what you can see in there is we've got a lovely imprint of that shield. Now, uh, you can get it a little bit tighter than that and a little bit more controlled and with better detail if you use a smaller piece of blue stuff like this one, uh, because then you can really get to get a lot of pressure in there and really focus it just on that section. And you can see the mold goes very, very hard indeed. And so now what we're gonna do is just grab some green stuff and uh, and really jam it in there and make ourselves a beautiful little shield. 
make sure you make more than you think you're going to need uh, for this shield because uh, it, it's handy to kind of really fill the mold out and then trim it all back together uh, when you've uh, when you've kind of got a nice hard surface to work with. You can carve it back and, and trim it down, but you really want to give yourself that excess flash to work with. There we go, nice and mixed, and now it's as simple as dropping it in there which can be uh, slightly less simple. <laughs> and then we're gonna grab our scalpel, put a bit of water on the end of it so that it's not sticky and use that to really jam it in there. And that way the green stuff will secure to the mold and you won't lift it back out as you're pressing it in. There we go, make sure you get lots of pressure all the way through so that you get a really good fix on that detail and try not to move the green stuff around as you do it. Uh, uh, and it's really important that the mold surface is dry so that, that green stuff isn't slipping around and it's holding a great shape. So, as you can see, it's not quite perfectly round just because of the way this mold was formed, but once we lift that out, you'll see that all of that area is actually all just flash and we'll get a nice uh, round mold impression that we can trim down into a beautiful little shield. All right, so I've actually gone and made a whole bunch of these little molds and I've just left them to completely cure overnight because it's really important that the green stuff is nice and hard when we demold them because you don't want to get any deformation of the details. So let's go and have a look at how these guys have turned out. As you can see, we've got our blue and our green and if you just pry it from the edges, it's really simple and you can get them out without doing too much damage. So there we can see that one isn't too bad with a little bit of re-sculpting on that central mold. Uh, we've got most of the gold inlay detail, uh, but the edge of the shield is a little bit munted, but definitely savable. Uh, you, you'll see that uh, I've done lots of these, and that's because uh, sometimes it just doesn't work, and you often need to do quite a few to get a good result. Let's have a look at this guy. This guy's got quite deep edges. Oh, once again, slightly damaged, but definitely saveable, definitely workable with a little bit of sculpting. Uh, you definitely get don't get as nice results as when you use silicon for a mold, uh, but of course this thermoplastic is completely reusable. Now let's have a look at this guy. I've got, I've got a good feeling about this one. Big prying that open, flexing the mold so I'm not damaging the green stuff. There we go, that's another nice one. That looks really good. That uh, little, once again, the little uh, golden nub will just need a bit more re sculpting. So that gives us a really great starting point. Now, obviously, the first thing we need to do is go and trim all of these down to size and get them looking all shieldy. So we'll go ahead and do that in a sec. So here are our five Royal Guard shields once they've been trimmed down a little bit and you can see that, you know, we've got the right idea and they're not too bad, but they certainly could be a little bit sharper and a little bit better, particularly if you've got access to better casting materials. The problem with green stuff, of course, is it's a solid, right? So the only way that we can force uh, the, the kind of material to flow into the mold is with brute force and really jamming it in there. So we're going to try working with a liquid, which is, of course, going to be much better because that is going to be able to flow right into the depths of the mold and get all of that detail in a really nice high level of relief. Now I've got some two-part epoxy resin here. It's just called Procast, which I get from my normal resin supplier. Uh, it's uh, you know a really simple stuff. Cures in about 10 minutes. You just mix it together in equal volumes, one to one, uh, and it's it's just really user friendly. Uh, make sure you're wearing lots of you know safety gear. You don't want this stuff on your fingers. It's all sticky, and you should be using a mask and doing all sorts of ventilation. Uh, so what we're going to do is just grab our two components and pour them into our mixing jug. Grab yourself a coffee stirrer. Now you'll see that I am mixing quite a reasonably large amount of resin compared to the very tiny volume of our molds down there. And that's because mixing at small quantities is quite tricky because it's very hard to get the ratio correct and you often end up uh, with kind of failed casks because the resin hasn't formed properly. So I'm mixing far more resin than I need and then slightly off camera I've actually got a whole bunch of other molds that I'll just pour the excess resin into to give, us, give myself you know, a few little barrels and corpses and other things. So so, once it's all mixed up, we've got, you know, three or four minutes of working time before it starts to mould off. And we just want to come in and really gently pour in a little bit of resin into each mould. Make sure that you go all the way up and over because there is a little bit of shrinkage as this cures. So it doesn't matter if you've got a little bit of surplus kind of pouring off, you can always cut that away. 
but the last thing you want to do is have you know a gaping hole in the back of your shield. There we go, a little bit more in that one, and a little bit more in that one. Easy as pie. Now, we'll come back in about five to six minutes, and I'll show you as that starts to cure, and, uh, and you'll see that we should get some really, really cool detail. So our resin has cured as we can clearly see by this huge spill patch, so let's have a look at how our moulds went off. Now you'll notice that I did actually secure them to the table using blue tack just to help level them out, because of course we're working with a liquid now, so we wanted it nice and level to try and minimise spillages. So there we can see all of that resin is completely cured, and just like the green stuff, in fact even easier than the green stuff, it just pops right open and we can get right into that resin. And there we go, that's not too bad of a cast. We've got uh, a lot better formation, a lot better detail on that nubbin than we did on the, uh, on the green stuff, so that's a good sign, working well so far. So I actually left those a little bit more because that first one was a bit soft and now we can see they are much, much firmer and popping out really nicely because we don't want to deform the resin on the way out. Jeez, have a look at that. That looks absolutely amazing. That's a really good one. Let's rip into the next one. Wow, another fantastic sculpt. You can really see the difference that the resin makes because it's such a, uh, a low viscosity, high flow uh, material when you're actually making your pour. So it's able to get in and capture all of those details. They are looking absolutely splendid. And lucky last. And just a slight little bubble there, but we can fill that very easily and a whole host of wonderful shields. So, let's do a bit of a compare and contrast. We'll grab all our little resin shields and then all our little green stuff shields. And then you guys can really have a look at the difference in detail resolution. That just And this isn't crazy high quality casting resin, guys. This is like the cheapest casting resin that I have. Uh, it's it, it's not long cure, it cures and I left it probably for about 20 minutes in the end to make sure it was really solid, but it goes hard-ish in sort of like 5 to 10. Uh, so very, very user-friendly to work with and going to be fantastic. So I'm going to jump in and clean up these shields and get them ready, and then we're going to get our Bannerman and Daewine all shielded up. Alright, so first up we're going to deal with our Bannerman. Now, the big thing to make him look like a Royal Guard is obviously we've got our shield and our spear, and we want to make sure that we don't see any of those greaves, because they're obviously not Royal Guard greaves. Conveniently, one of his arms is hidden behind the banner, and in the foot pose we can't actually see either of them, which helps us out a great deal. So what we're going to do with this mounted guy is we're going to throw his shield on his forearm, just like a normal Royal Guard, and then uh, we'll chuck a spear on his back and give him some some sort of uh, some sort of cool sling uh, and then for our foot model uh, because of his pose he's not really going to be uh, equipped for any shielding wielding uh, without uh, a massive kind of cape cutting conversion that we can't be bothered doing so we're just going to do uh, a classic uh, shield and spear on back look which is a look that some people hate uh, but I absolutely love it I actually have been starting to convert my riders of Rohan to uh, to look like this because I think it looks super badass he's too busy wielding the banner to have his shield at the ready so it's all going to sling on his back so the first thing we need to do is glue down our uh, our spear hafts because uh, they are going to be the supporting element uh, conveniently with uh, we'll start with the foot mounted guy there's a, a really nice groove in the back of his cloth that this will just slot neatly into. So I'm just going to use my F gel, uh, which is of course uh, just normal CA glue that's a little bit viscous. It's got a bit of a gel-like quality. We'll drop a bit of that into the groove. Don't need to over glue it. Uh, and then we can drop the spear right in. There we go. So that is going to be our uh, little foot version. Now for our Mounted Fellows shield, I'm just going to sculpt a little bit of uh, a kind of slot for his arm to nestle in, just so that we can keep the shield a little bit of a flatter profile, uh, and it's not sort of sticking out so awkwardly against the model. So uh, this is the great thing of course about working with, uh, with resin, is it's very easy to kind of just get your scalpel in there. And, uh, and dig a chunk out. Just make sure you don't dig too much because you can go through to the other side. Uh, and then when we sit that on, there we go. It's, it's sitting a little bit more flush. We can probably go just a tiny bit more as well. 
Uh, and something that's also important to think about is, of course, this model is mounted, so we want to be gluing that in a way uh, that isn't going to get in the way of the horse. Similarly, on the back of the mounted rider, there's a nice little groove that we can sort out our, uh, our wonderful little throwing spear, uh, and then we can come in later and do a bit of green stuff work to make a little, uh, little sling that's going over his shoulder, holding that in place. So now it's time to get Deowine looking all Royal Guardy. Once we grab a uh, little Rohan Royal Guard shield, uh, that's already starting to do a whole lot. Getting that on there is going to look really fantastic. But to do a little bit more, we're going to give him a nice juicy Royal Guard arm to replace his normal Son of Earl axe, uh, which is not really on theme or on profile at all. So what I've done is I've grabbed a spare Royal Guard arm from the infantry set uh, and I have taken it and cut it in half so that I can articulate the elbow joint uh, and separated the shoulder pads from the hand and the foregreave, the kind of arm bracer, and, uh, and cut off the very top of the shoulder pad so that it nestles in nicely underneath his cloak because technically there'd still be another element of shoulder pad there but we're just going to say that it's under his cloak. Uh, now I've pinned this all together using some brass rod and using my pin vise and I've also set a new hole just there below the old hole in uh, Deowine's arm. So if I just slot this guy in and it goes there, we can see he's gonna hold up in something like that and that allows us to have a bit of a play and change the angle of his sword and have a bit of a dance around with a cool dynamic pose as he rides into battle. So that is certainly gonna add a nice little royal guard element uh, because of course we've got those beautiful royal guard stylings in there because his normal armor doesn't exactly look like the royal guard but I'm pretty happy with that. I mean I, I like that he looks a little bit different anyway because it makes him really easy to distinguish on the battlefield if I just grab my little Royal Guard shield here, I think that is going to look pretty special. So I'll jump into gluing all of that up and green stuffing those joints just like we went through earlier in a little bit. And then of course we have our foot model. Now what I'm actually going to do for our foot model is use the Harmer model. Now this doesn't 100% uh, match what I have in the mounted version, uh, but it also means that I'm then going to have a cool Harmer, which I'll need later on at some point. And also I just, I, I really think it's such a lovely model. It gives me a great excuse to use it uh, and uh, and, and that way I don't have to use, you know, any kind of really dodgy, lame foot models. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the unreleased miniatures foot versions of the uh, the Son of Earl foot models, and we have no other official Games Workshop ones, so Harmer is going to be the basis. And we're not going to do much to him, we are simply going to come in with a razor saw. Uh, where is my razor saw? I'm just going to come in with my razor saw and do a big cut straight through that elbow line so that we can reposition his hand and then we're going to throw the Royal Guard shield on the top there uh, and uh, and have it sort of kind of in a bit more of a dynamic pose than Harmer's existing position. And then what we might have to do is do a little bit of treatment to the back of this shield. Uh, maybe try and put some wood grain in or at least get the surface really flat so that we can paint wood grain because it is going to be so visible uh, mounted onto his shield there. And then we're going to have a really dynamic looking pose for both Harmer, uh, sorry, Deowine, and, uh, and our Royal Guard banner. Bear. So I'm going to jump into that. Now the trick when cutting Harmer's arm to reposition it is to get our razor saw and slot it right between the groove of the two armor plates. We can see here that there's a little gap of about one and a half millimeters where the plates from the shoulder pad run down into the arm guard and there's a little bit of cloth where there's no armor where we can cut safely. All right, so I've lined up. I'm just gonna make sure I set the blade in that exact position. And as you can see, that has begun to cut directly above the arm guard and below the shoulder blades. Now I'm also gonna come in from the backside and provide a secondary cut following the curve of that arm guard. Again, just focusing on cutting the fabric. I'm not gonna be able to cut very deep because my saw will start to nick the shoulder pad after a little while, but that will start to allow me to weaken the joint and then I'll be able to rip that forward, pulling on all of the metal that's been cut, uh, which will plastically deform and pull uh, the cloth sections of detail without affecting the armor. So our joint is getting almost ready to pull. I'll make one final cut up this way from underneath 
just to try and separate that lower cloth from the cape and hopefully I won't destroy it too much that I have to do too many repairs to the cape. Just a small incision. Uh, just to really weaken that joint, there we go. That's gone a little bit into the armor plating, but that part is going to be pulled across his body, so we should be okay. Now what I'm going to do is grab my scalpel and use that to apply uniform pressure to the entire arm joint and start to really bend it. So you have to apply a bit of force and you'll actually hear the sound of the joint cracking, but the, what you want to do is make sure it's bending at the right place and not starting to deform the arm guard because of course that shouldn't be curved. So I can see that that's starting to get a tiny curve so I'm going to try and work on this joint a little bit more. I haven't cut it enough. Uh, this back section is probably going to be the ticket. There we go, that's just about hitting the armor plate so let's see if I can pull that again. There we go, now she's moving. Fantastic, look at that. So the arm pose is changing dramatically and it is this part of deforming uh, metal that is warping, not the arm guard. That's exactly what we want. So let's just grab a little shield and have a look at how we're getting there. So that's getting a little bit more dynamic. Could be cool if we could, we could bring it over a little bit more. Let's see what we can do. There we go. Now, yeah. All right, so you can see now I have completely freed up this arm guard uh, and I pretty much have complete control over wherever I want that arm to go now. So that is a job well done, perfectly executed, and the damage that I did do to the armor on the inside is now so hidden by the closed off elbow joint, we can't see it at all. So I'm just going to play with that for a little bit and then we'll... Uh glue ourselves down one of our shields and then uh, do a little bit of green stuff work to patch this elbow join. So um, final members of the Royal Guard contingent are assembled. There is Deowine's foot model with his gorgeous shield, Deowine's lovely dynamic mounted pose with that big kind of stuck out sword arm ready to hack off a few orc necks, and then we've got uh, our bannerman here who's got his short sword sorry his spear and his shield hooked up across his back and you'll also notice that I've given him a little bit of a horse mane and extended that down from the top of his helmet just to add a little bit more of a royal guard flair with a little bit of green stuff and then I have done the same on his mounted equivalent uh, adding just a little uh, uh, spear binding element there and putting some horse hair and some extra helmet detail on just to give him a little bit more royal guard presence so there we have it after a long night and following morning of sculpting we've got a really fantastic Rohan Royal Guard force led by their captain Daewine that looks absolutely varied and dynamic there's no duplicates of posing and it looks like a really fantastically well modeled force I hope that was useful to you guys it's certainly really important to me to have this level of detail and posing particularly in a list that is such sort of low model count and really focused on the detail so I hope you guys really got something out of that of course the next stage is to take the brush and paint to these models and we're going to be doing that in the next episode of the Muster of Rohan so make sure you guys tune in for that. If you haven't checked out all the other episodes I've linked them down in the description below and make sure if you're new around here you do subscribe and check out all the cool Middle Earth strategy battle game content we have here on the channel. There is bucket loads of it now. Battle reports and terrain and painting guides. Lots and lots of juicy stuff to check out and a hell of a lot more coming. Like I talked about before we've got the rest of this whole army to build. I've still got to do AMA. Uh, I've still got to do something for Dernhelm. I've got to finish painting all of these models. Uh, and then, of course, I've got the tournament to play as well. Our first big league event for the season for this army. Uh, and we're going to be doing a full coverage plan of all of those games, which is going to be totally awesome. So make sure you guys stick around for that. Subscribe and hit the notification so you can follow along this week as we pump out all of these Master of Rohan episodes. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys real soon. Thanks so much for watching. And remember... Keep on SBG Gaming. Cheers, guys.